Well, 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 here we are again. <laughs> another day, another dollar. Well, not quite such. Uh, of course, on my, on my, to my left or lower down, I've got Robert Banks. Uh, welcome again. And uh, up above me, there he is, uh, oh, Martin Goffrey. How are you doing, sir? How are you doing all? Not too bad, not too bad. Oh. Uh, doing good. I froze the main line for the supermarket, but other than that, you can't say everything good. <laughs> it's long. I, I, I was very lucky. I was very lucky. I mean, I had one person in front of me uh, going to Liddell and to Asda, so, and then made it five minutes before the stream. So, fantastic, fantastic. Right. I may have to come over to your area tomorrow. Uh, no. Mine is yeah. strict on the road. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. It's crazy so, times, crazy times. So we, we kind of touched a little bit on the, um, you know, the announcement that uh, Basketball England put out with the results, uh, uh, but not nearly in the kind of maybe the depth that we can talk about because Mr. 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 Banks is uh, here today. Uh, so what was, your, what was your take on it, then, Bob? Look, I mean, it's, um, it was always going to be a difficult task because the season ended abruptly without a plan. And um, I also checked the rules. And there was no clarity on what happens should the season um, end prematurely in terms of how you were going to set the tables. I think they went away. They had a discussion, Basketball England, and tried to come out with a situation that they felt was, was overall fair. Unfortunately, that situation doesn't work for, um, for all scenarios. Um, my under-18 team is one that is in a precarious situation, which I have absolutely no explanation to the um, to the boys other than the than the math that was elected to be used by Basketball England. Mm -hmm. So, for people that don't understand, I believe uh, what they did was they went with the remaining games that was left because not everyone plays the same number of games, and they split the points between the two for all remaining games. Okay, in juniors, was little, seniors, it was basically splitting one point in the senior games because basically the seniors uh, in the tables, if you win, you get two points. If you lose, you get zero. In the junior uh, games, someone will have to explain the rationale and the logic to this one to me because I don't completely understand it. You get three points if you win and one point if you lose. Okay, so then you have to make a decision. How do you split three? Mm. If I read the, um, the announcement correctly, the split of the three points was two and two. Mm. Okay, then they went through a process that you had to have all of your games already um, rebooked uh, to be played for the rest of the season for you to get the two points. Okay. So in my scenario with our under-18s, which is why, you know, it's a little bit difficult to explain to the boys, we ended up with a record of 12-1. And one, and uh, we ended up finishing third uh, behind, sorry, Rams 1, who was 17-1. and one. And by the way, we also hold the head-to-head -head against sorry, Rams. Mm. And then the second-place team was Ready Rockets, who was 10-6, and six, who incidentally lost, uh, lost five more games than us and won two less games than us, but still uh, managed to achieve a higher standing in the, uh, in the tables because of the math. It's nothing to do with Reading. It's just basically the math uh, that was used. And I'm sure if they use different math, somebody else would be not happy. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those situations that I, that I look at it, and I'm not, and I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but it's just difficult to explain to to young boys and keep in mind we have an under 18 team but we have all but three are uh, either under 14s or under 16s that play on the that play on the team so it's quite difficult to explain to them how they finished third uh with a materially better record than teams uh than teams above them other than the fact that it was math that was elected to be used so in this case what are the actual practical implications of that because were you thinking about trying to take the team to Prem? Because, as I said, I was in your league, and it was definitely you guys, Surrey Rams, in the battle. And if you had the head-to-head, -head, we'd have known you'd have won out the rest of those games. 
I, you know, we can talk about what ifs. But how does that actually affect you guys? Because I would say we had a similar situation, but we didn't play out our final two games. So the team that won in our league, they, they, they're the champ, but they can sit there and say, all right, fair enough, we are, because they, they only lost one game. We lost it. So there's a possibility yeah. we could have done something, but we didn't. So they can, you know, they can sit there fairly. But there's no way that I think a team could be there and think you guys weren't at minimum set. So but in, as, as in actually affecting your program going forward, will it have any implications on it? Like for your plans next year maybe to... When, uh, whenever we're able to actually have a group meeting again, we will sit down with the uh, with the players and the parents, and we'll have a discussion about what we're going to do next season. Um, the implications could be is if we elect to put this team in the prim next season, uh, and that's also depending on the players that come back, um, and also the funding available to to play prim because you play more matches and you have more travel and you have a bigger time commitment. So. The implication would be, other than pe people not feeling that they were treated fairly, uh, the only other implication would be as if we're uh, not allowed to go into prim next season, which which we will have a discussion with Basketball England about that because at some given at some given point in time, I'm sure they will be fair because um, we finished in the top eight of the last uh, three years. So um, mm -hmm. I think in terms of developing talent. And having a, a record of success, I believe it's uh, I believe is there. We've actually achieved that with um, three different sets of core players on each one of those years. Uh, sorry, two of the three years. The third year would have been this year, which obviously there was no 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 tournament. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we said a bit yesterday. It's it's not a situation that anyone factored. So. It's difficult to start coming up with a, what the solution was to make everybody happy. But I guess I just hope that when if team do appeal, there's a bit more of a focus looking to at the actual situations within the league. Because um Yeah. You know, like we we are in that situation now. We thought we were in a position where we thought, you know, under sixteen we have a good chance of winning out our games and potentially either being even if we lost in the head-to-head, -head, we would have had the same amount of um, losses as a team if we won our last two games. And that gives us a good place to move forward into requesting for a prem spot. Especially seeing as a lot of our players, like yours, are younger year. So it gets to a point where you want those players, if they're at the level where they're serious about basketball, if they can play at the highest level, then they should be allowed. You know, so... Yeah. I hope when we go and have a conversation with England Basketball about it and put the details, I'm putting a letter together now on that, you know, we'll, we'll get the chance to at least be, you know, have a fair look at, all right, well, give them a chance to go up or that's what I, that's how I've got my fingers crossed. Anyway. Yeah. Look, you know, at this stage, we're not going to get overly uh, emotional on it unless we get that situation that we want to go the prim. Uh, I think the boys will understand we're doing our best effort. We got a few boys that are trying to go overseas to play uh, in, in some prep schools. Hopefully, hopefully we've been successful in, um, in landing them some locations that that uh, that makes sense for them. Um, if we if we don't, then obviously we're, we'll look to uh, to try to move up, and then we'll have the discussion with Basketball England. I will say overall, when we've had these types of discussions, um, for the most part, they've been fair. So I don't expect mm -hmm. to. Um, for them not to to listen to to the uh, to the argument, and if it has some foundation, I'm sure they they will be willing to to move forward on it. But it's also very difficult because sometimes to move you forward means they've got to disappoint someone else. So um, <laughs> there, there 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 will have to be a balance in that in that approach. But uh, at this stage, it's um, you know it's it's just that particular uh, situation. So, Bob, what's your opinion regarding this whole Premier Conference setup and how you feel it should work? Look, um, I, 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 I spoke a few days ago. Um, the biggest challenge that you have, I do 
I do think that the better players should be in a situation where they can play against each other. Uh, but unfortunately, that needs to be in a situation where it's economically feasible and also executable for the clubs and the parents. Um, I, I, I said the other day that I could, I could see a scenario where you start off with the first half of the year going regional and then the second half of the year split it up in uh, a prim and conference. And, um, and I think that's actually reasonably, reasonably fair, and it does cut out a fair bit of the expenses uh, at least half of the year for travel um, in that perspective. But yeah. it's a very difficult one not to, uh, not, not to have the split. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, I guess what's, that's why they get paid all the big money up there at basketball. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but you know the the real dilemma that we face, uh, Martin, is um, not having significant numbers uh, at these at these age groups playing the sport. Um, yeah. When I when I was in Australia, when I was in Australia a few years ago, um, you you didn't really have this dilemma because. Um, you had for each team, just imagine um, for every team that you'd have, and most clubs would have um, two, maybe three teams per age group. And for every, for every team, they would have 100 to 200 players trying out. Yeah. And imagine what? having a one to 200 players trying out with, with, with tryout fees as well, which helps the, the financial side work. And I think the other thing that they that they do a really good job of there, which I'd like to see some contribution uh, in the UK from, it's much greater support from the councils. Uh, when you when you, when you get a club that's at a standard that would play, they have it's called state league back in the day, but which which would be equivalent to the national league here. For you to uh, apply, you ultimately have to have support from your council that includes getting you a viable venue to play in. Yeah. And, I mean, what do you think one of the biggest hindrances for it is? For my limited experience being back in, the, the court fees are just crazy. And, I mean, what you have to do in, in order to be financially viable as a club, you know, I think they need to, they need to be more support about the venues for these kids to play. I, I think agree. kids will come out like, if, if the cost is right, because you have to cost it at a certain level, which really rules out a lot of people it does i i think i think there's i think we should look go back as as a group and give recommendations of how to restructure the costing model mm -hmm. you know for for example if you're running a club you know we pay for a minimum on a junior game two to um two table officials and two relatively senior referees um, in Australia, the table officials would be parents who are qualified, and if you were not qualified as a parent, you would have the responsibility to find and hire a qualified refer uh, table official to do your turn. So you take away all the costs from the table official, and then the referees are, are more junior, but they have a court supervisor who manages the junior referees. So you're basically paying uh, one salary for your course of the day. And that's a that's a big savings. And if you throw that in plus a, a funded court, it changes the whole perspective of having um, uh, the financial situation for clubs and players. Yeah. And also, I mean, there's also the situation where you can't. You, sometimes I find in certain clubs, I guess you're a little bit held to ransom because you have to maintain the players no matter what they do. So you put anyone in national league or any, you know, there isn't that. You know, it takes away some way the desire to be, you know, I'm fighting to get onto that team. And I know I, I can yes. work up maybe one or two teams to get there. And that type of competition, I think, helps. But early on, it's like, we need numbers. So if exactly. 12 guys show, 12 guys are in. You know what I mean? Um, well, it's something to think about. I just, it's, it's a shame because I think it's such a game, you know, when, when kids get in, it's such a positive force. It's such a positive force on kids. And with all these issues they're talking about, you know, there should be more getting done. Because you get, I found this, my son started off playing football. And the difference between that and basketball, regarding how it changes his whole, the way he held himself, was huge. And so I think the support, you know, 
don't know. I've had these conversations for years, but they'll keep on going. I see Rupert down there. He's getting ready to. Yeah, I, I am indeed. <laughs> Just yeah. mod moderating. Uh, and of course, we've uh, come to the end of our segment. So, oh, so we're allowed to go and enjoy our Saturday night then now. <laughs> <laughs> you know but uh yeah so so after us we've we've got um uh, chris hughes and um and chuck drew actually so uh you know feel free to to, to tune into that and then after them we have um uh, jason york and daniel maxwell and they were on yesterday as well so um you know there, there's interest uh to to extend what we're doing as well from nutritionists uh, and hopefully uh you know try and get some of uh, that physio thing going on as well so you know we're definitely trying to expand what we're doing and uh yeah thank you uh robert and martin and uh yeah let's do this again yep a pleasure good to see you guys all enjoy right. your evening all right thank you all right bye bob all right thank you all right, bye bye, bye, -bye. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Hughes, and today is the lovely installment of our daily show, and I'm honoured to have Chuck Duru as our honoured guest today, and first of many guests planned in the upcoming days and weeks. Welcome, Chuck. How are you? You all right? Okay, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, keep us up busy while we're going for this uh, troubling time. We've uh, watched lots of Sky Sports and uh, basketball highlights keep me going. Yeah, likewise, likewise. A lot of highlights, a lot of uh, old games and stuff. Yeah. So, um, people don't know, Chuck Dewey is captain and star of Essex Leopards and had yeah, an amazing season, season, managed to turn things around and get their ticket for the NBL 1 next season. So, I'd love to ask Chuck what was his highlight from the... Uh, March when they went for three nil one, which influential in there, securing the NBL one status. I think all three games were, were a highlight um, in, for different reasons. Um, you look at the Reading game; we came off the back of two back-to-back -back losses against Derby and against Thames Valley. Um, the message in the in the team um, after those two games was we needed to just have some more fight, I think, and grit. That was what was missing. Um, I think X's and O's were, were there. I think we had the talent. I think we showed against them um, in our game against Hemel um, that we had we had the talent, but we just we lacked the grit. I think, and um, to be honest, I think the Reading game came at a perfect time. To be honest, because if you if you look at Reading teams. Um, Alan always has his teams, regardless of the talent, they always play hard. So I think it came at the right time. Um, so yeah, I think that that game was a highlight in itself because I think it was pivotal um, in our survival, to be honest. Um, it's a game that went to overtime, but to be honest, either team could have won. Um, so I got the live stats, it was over side to side, and I thought, oh, it just looked like you guys had the edge. You sort of had a bit of a lead when they fought back, and it was that quite an interesting game to be there so yeah definitely. no no it definitely was man it, it, i had a lot of messages after the game saying how good the game was and um like i said man either team could have won i just think down the stretch we just made more plays um i think defensively was one of our best games of the year um and yeah i think we got it done no amazing um have you got any plans for next season what's what's the uh, what's plans for that um, so I'm in talks with resigning. Um, I've had a chat with Coach Baker. Um, 
so yeah, most likely going to be signed. Um, nothing's yet been obviously been finalised, but uh, at the minute, yeah, most likely looking to come back. Awesome. So, but the second part of the segment is sort of, you know, like a um, light-hearted quiz with players, see how much they know about the club. So, for the <laughs> listeners, it's a great way for them to uh, learn a bit about the stats, a bit about the players behind it. So, um, it's the structure is um, I'll ask you a question about points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks. You have a choice between an easy two point shot or a three point shot. So, first set of points, would you like an easy question or a tough one? Uh, I'll go with a tough one. Give me a tough, a tough one. one. Yeah. All right. So, we we talked a bit about the um, some of the games you did well in, and obviously in March you had that three point win versus Liverpool. Um, three of your guys dropped. Double figures. Can you tell me which ones they were and who out of the three got the best field goal percentage? Uh, well, one was me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one was me. Um, I'd say the other two were Orland and LVC. Yeah, well then, who, who got the best uh, field goal percentage? <sighs> Might have been me, actually. I it think was I shot you, pretty well that game. Yeah, I think it was me. Se- yeah, you shot 75%. The other guys <laughs> all in second with 53.8 and LVC got 40. Right, so we've yeah. all to rebounds. Same again, easy or hard? I'm um, staying, you know, let's go with the difficult one. Let's go with the hard yeah, one. Get the points on the board, yes, I like that. Yeah. So, to get the three points, you get both parts of this question right. So, um, to the nearest number... How many rebounds did Orland Jackman average in his time with you guys? And what game did he get his highest? Uh, I, know, I know what game he got his highest. Yeah. That would have been against Nottingham. Yeah. I think he had, he had 20 that game, I think. He did, yeah, yeah. Uh, his average... I'm going to go with 14... Yeah, mate, you're right on the money there. 14 rebounds. Oh, good. Yeah, I shot 13.8, but I was like, I'm pretty sure that was only at the point eight bit. I thought, close number. I mean, now <laughs> I'm easy or tough. I, I, I'd imagine what you're going to say, but I asked you anyway. Might as well get it three in a row. Give me a tough one. That's it. Three on the way. Also, if you get four or five out of those fresh right, you get a chance for one and one. So let's see how you get on. So. Alfie Sidushi, we just mentioned earlier, got a seat height of nine assists versus Derby. But what was his season total? So there's a multiple choice question. A, 21. B, 26. Or C, 31. It's not 21. No. It's a tie between 26 and 31. I'm going to go with 31. Correct, the Monday. You're, you're doing well on this. I'm probably made it a bit too yeah, easy. Yeah. <laughs> right, let me from the steals. I know my teammates, man. <laughs> you know your teammates. I've got, yeah. Captain this yeah, right. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know for hard to get, I imagine, are you? Say that again, sorry. Hi. Right. I. So now we move on to steals. I guess you want yeah. the hard question again, yeah? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Anyways, so Fred Slarty got a season high of five steals first derby. But how many did he get in the entire season? Again, the multiple choice. So we got 31, 41, or 51. I'm going to go 41. Mate, you're on fire. Uh, 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 <laughs> right. And blocks. You know, it's hard again, I guess. Yeah, this is going to be oh, hard no. one, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you got a block for Sparky and Abby, but who got the most total blocks for your side? Was it Afiv Abdul or Ray Akpafuri? I hope I said those names right. <laughs> I'm going to go with Ray. Ray? No. It was close. Oh. Afiv got 11 and Ray got 9. But you've done oh, none, done. got enough for you and one question. So, in one game, you posted your NBL season high for points and rebounds. Can you time, tell me either who it was against, 
And are your points and rebounds stats for that game? Um, I think it was Thames Valley. Yeah. And it was 18 points and 14 yeah. rebounds. Well, my computer's just frozen, but yes, that is correct. The correct answer, well done, mate. So you did rebound that one. So, um, coming up, we've got Jason York and Daniel Maxwell coming up next. So while we wait, I thought maybe I could just ask you a few questions about any exercise you recommend for people to be doing to keep in shape while we're whilst they're maybe self isolating. Yeah, I mean, um. I've been doing, um, I've just been running really. I've been doing a lot of jogging. Um, I live quite near a park. Um, so I've been jogging in the park. Um, otherwise, you know, you've, if you've got a skipping rope, you can skip. Um, I've seen people, some of my friends um, skipping in like, the front of their house and stuff. Um, there's a lot of like YouTube sort of house workouts you can do. A lot of famous um, athletes are doing their own little workouts on Instagram Live. I know I think Tyson Fury did one with his um, with his wife the other day. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff you can do, man. I know I know everyone's complaining about home workouts and how much they miss the gym and whatnot, but there's stuff yeah. you can do like that, man. Um, I personally, I like I like jogging, so I, I jog. I've done about I think I did five k today. I did eight k the other day. I tried jog about. My target's twenty k a week. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Definitely working those miles up. Danny half marathon yeah. tour of that, or no, 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 no. Oh, nah, no, no plans to do a half marathon. No. I don't think my niece could take it. No. Anyway, uh, straight, it's straight having you on, and thank you for coming on. And coming up is Jason York and Daniel Maxwell. Thank you very much, mate. Take care. Uh, Cheers, Chris. Cheers, bye. November 2015, one of our volunteer coaches had contacted us to say that Akeem had turned up at his wife's solicitor's office. Yeah, we had a meeting with Rob and Kirk. Both of them are so devoted to building the club. And uh, once I brought my, my kids down, I saw the potential of what this can become. I like to uh, 
congratulates everybody for their role in the camp. When he walks in, there's no doubt. Everybody, the room just lights up. You know, everybody kind of recognizes him for being one of the greatest to ever play this position of all time. Even as coaches now, you know, we're still in a phase of learning new knowledge. Once the, the kids get the feel and the taste of the game, he's addicted. When I see uh, the potential of the youth basketball and what Rob and Kirk have done to build this club, it was very natural for me to get me involved with the club. The man himself is a He's just a phenomenal human being, um, very caring, very giving of his time and very demanding as well of us as a club in, in what we're trying to do and achieve. We have a wealth of knowledge and experience coaches. We brought guys from the US and uh, Rob and Kirk, they set up all the, you know, the local coaches that have the passion for the game, that are willing to give their time and effort. The profile of the club has risen dramatically in the past two years, helping us aspire and attract new young talent that will hopefully be in the future of the club. When I walk in this morning, it was very, very impressive. And uh, you can see the players are serious about the game. They want to learn and they're happy to be here. And that energy, you can see it. And you see the coaches, they have the passion to teach. And I can't be more proud of the organization, what they've done.